So today we're going to talk about considerations for human-robot collaboration. Um, so uh, I direct the Assistive Robotics and Manipulation Laboratory, the ARM Lab, where our mission uh, is to develop assistive robotics uh, that are intelligent, um, assistive, collaborative, and are able to improve human life. The main area of our focus um, covers um, robotic assistants, which you can think of as external agents that are going to work alongside a person. Intelligent wearables, these are robots that are attached to a person that are um, helping them to perform a task and require situational awareness. Uh, and then connected devices, so these might be more passive but still require uh, situational awareness um, in order to anticipate the service needs um, for the people that you're wanting to work with. And all the problems that we have, uh, we have this similar paradigm where the robot needs to be aware of itself the complexity of the task it's trying to complete, as well as perhaps the human or other agent uh, that's in the loop that it has to collaborate with. I'm very fortunate to uh, be working with many amazing, amazing uh, PhD uh, and master students, and I'll fortunately be able to highlight some of their work today. So if we think about uh, the path of robotics and how it's evolved over the past few decades, we can see that um, collaborative robotics really stands to be one of the pinnacle points um, that uh, robotics has to offer. If you go back to like the 80s through the 2000s, automation was really big. We had these you know, robots that were able to do these amazing things. They had a lot of power. Um, and the goal was if you could set up you know, your system such that they could do a repetitive task very well, you could complete um, some of these tasks efficiently with these types of systems. But then we realized um, that there was more to be had here if we could introduce this ability for our robot to operate in environments that were less certain, right? So could you operate in a space with still a degree of precision and repeatability even when um, things weren't carefully uh, uh, set up for you as it was on the, for instance, on the manufacturing floor? And so we see this introduction and this, this rise of autonomy. Then uh, we had this big push towards swarm robotics. So these are multiple robots that work together. Often, you know, in these really big uh, groups, you know, there might be some central oracle that's telling all of the agents what to do, and yet we're able to do these really amazing things. Uh, and then you have these decentralized systems. As the functionality increases and the numbers increase and the physical scale and distance increase, it becomes important that each one of these systems actually have, if you will, a mind of its own and yet still be able to collaborate with robots in its vicinity and operate toward a larger objective of the, uh, of this, of the system. And then finally, we have this, this augmentation. So what if the other agent that you're working with is not, for instance, another robot that you can digitally communicate with? What if it's a person? How can you take everything from automation to autonomy to the ability to work in teams and now allow that collaborator to be robot or human. So uh, to give an idea of some of the things that we've been thinking about in this kind of space, we have you know, considerations you could imagine. And this is just a subset of collaborative ideas you could, uh, could think of. This is some that were uh, of interest to us in the ARM lab. How could robots perhaps carry objects with human counterparts? Could you have wearable sensors, for instance, that could predict where a person wants to go and if there's a risk of falling perhaps alert them, or if it's integrated with a lower limb exoskeleton, actually be an input for control? How can a robot work with a human to A, understand a complex task that you want the robot to complete, um, such as efficient learning from demonstration? And then if the robot's working with a person, how can that robot be super efficient um, in that process with the human? If we think about uh, the space of prosthetics, um, is there value to having a robotic system that has a degree of autonomy when it works with um, a human counterpart in order to complete a complex task that the person may otherwise not be able to do on their own? What does this mean in the space of autonomy to have a robot that understands the environment and yet um, wants to share that autonomy with the person, um, particularly if you think at levels four and five where you're not completely handing over control to the robot, maybe there's a need for transition. What does shared autonomy look like and how can that be collaborative? And you could even imagine this in extended scenario, such as you know, uh, leveraging these types of tools to improve the ability to um, even perform uh, interpretation, such as you know, um, ASL. How can you pull all of these informations from a person, such as their facial expressions, in addition to some of their gestures, and think of that sequentially in that interpretation? Uh, many of these ideas have been of interest to us over the last few years. 
So today, I want to ask three primary questions. One, what makes an effective collaborator? Two, what tools do we have and what do we need to make robots effective collaborators? And three, uh, what must be considered for human-robot teams? So let's start with what makes an effective collaborator. So if we kind of think about um, how robots collaborate with each other, this sort of robot-robot collaboration scenario, we can really look at um, perhaps even centralized or decentralized control where these robots are actually able to communicate via digital communication. And so here this is a, a swarm of quad rotors that are flying in unison in this figure eight. You have two perspectives of them, um, and they're actually able to collaborate, and they share this information at some base station, some oracle. You can imagine um, scaling this up, um, and if you do, then consensus becomes very important such that desired behavior um, of each agent uh, is prescribed, or they know or they're told what they need to do in order to um, be successful. So this is how you know, robots can effectively work together, and we have really great demonstrations of this um, collaboration. But if we can think about what could be, um, perhaps it would be a good idea to look at how humans um, or biological agents uh, work together, and maybe we can have some motivation from um, that kind of uh, uh, interaction. So if you look at these sort of biological coordination uh, abilities and strategies, we see that biological agent, team, uh, agent teams are especially good with coordination even without digital communication. And so the question we can ask here is what makes an effective team? You know, if you, if you observe this scenario here, there's clearly not a lot of communication, and yet they're able to actually uh, coordinate in an extremely high level, um, even uh, beating out, for instance, this other team to make this point. So some of the, uh, uh, the goals that we need to, in order to have uh, an effective team include shared goals or objectives among teammates. If we take this scenario, right, are they both intending on making the basket? Are they both going to the same side of the court? Is there the ability to model teammates uh, for behavior prediction? Even if we share the same goal, we want to make the basket, for instance, if you know, your teammate is unable to perform in a particular athletic way, then that should actually change your behavior and how you expect to interact with them. And then finally, uh, the ability to plan given your personal and teammates' roles. Right? So given the shared objective, given an understanding of the uh, policy, if you will, or the ability of your uh, teammates, how can you leverage that to roll out and plan what actions you should take that will benefit the entire team? And so the question is, right, if these are the objectives, how could this be achieved? Particularly if we think about cases where, you know, these biological agents are able to perform at a high level with limited communication modalities, such as audio, vision, um, and tactile. So if you think about you know, per, uh, for instance, the audio uh, uh, method of communication, this allows for high specificity, right? You know, I'm talking to you, I'm describing this process to you. The trouble is it could be slow, right? So it's not necessarily operation tempo and is subject to, um, you know, the sequential speaking, listening uh, that might re be required, especially when you want to do something quickly that requires a lot of uh, high uh, coordination. Vision, on the other hand, um, uh, can be done mutually. And information exchange can be very fast um, and, in fact, very detailed. And so I would argue this video you see here of these, uh, I think they're border collies, uh, actually forcing these ducks into this ring, you know, they're taking action about where they're placing themselves relative to uh, the, the ducks in order to um, drive them to the target. But they also have to take into account where their teammate is and leverage their position relative to that teammate's position in their motion in order to coordinate that motion, you know, for instance here, of the ducks. And so here there's this visual communication that's allowing for that op-tempo operation and collaboration. In fact, you can imagine even on, the, on a completely different scale, if you think about, for instance, even how insects like bees are able to communicate very complex concepts about where, for instance, food might be. Again, you have this notion of communication through um, visual demonstration um, to uh, a teammate. And then you can have the, uh, the tactile side, right? And so if you think about touch or forces for communication, this can also be extremely fast. But of course, you have this sort of proximity requirement. 
So here you have uh, an individual who's visually impaired, and yet, you know, at the same op tempo that the game is actually occurring, his, uh, their friend is able to actually communicate to them the state of the game, and you know, they're able to celebrate in real time with that very quick tactile uh, communication. If we think about the key features of teamwork, I would argue there's two main paradigms uh, we need to think about. On the one side, we have role understanding. So, you know, just if, if you look, go back to the border colleagues or, you know, any one of these other scenarios, even the basketball game, how do you actually collaborate with a person? What is your role that uh, is required in order to achieve your target? Is it unique, you know, given the particular task that you're trying to complete? And then finally, if we try to think about what kind of conditions we need to think about in order for agents to work together, we might have to develop some notation for or, or thinking in terms of trust between these agents. And kind of going back to what we talked about in terms of the agreed objectives and being able to um, understand what another teammate is able to do in order to then roll out a plan to collaborate, if we take those two top elements, right, then we could argue that a condition for trust, a condition for collaboration and taking action that you believe will lead to the betterment of the goals of the entire team would include A, having an agreed objective with the teammates that you're working with, and then having a behavioral model of your teammates. Um, and if you have these two things, if you know that you're trying to achieve the same thing and you have a good idea of their um, policy and their capabilities, then you can actually leverage this information to work effectively together. And so a very simple toy example of this could be you know, uh, this strategy um, on whether or not, for instance, this red car will change lanes here. You know, before uh, red trusts blue, it has to first agree uh, that it believes blue does not want to collide. That's an objective. But then you know, even if blue clearly didn't want to collide, if, you know, be, uh, if the blue's brakes are not that great, that's the control authority part of that paradigm. So even if the objective was you know, uh, uh, parallel, does the behavioral model, does the controllability match that objective, right? And if it does, if blue is able to maintain that velocity or brake um, as necessary, then what you can imagine um, doing is having a scenario where red can therefore trust that it's safe, for instance, to merge in front of blue. So, you know, if we think about what are the natural limitations, you know, of biological teams, we see that, you know, there are instances where there's a limited communication modality, you know, limited dexterity um, and strength to weight ratio, uh, and possibly limited perception. Um, and if we think about how these biological teams are actually able to overcome these challenges, we see that they really leverage the understanding of the role given the team and task. They uh, model the task, and they model their teammates. So we see these attributes. So the question is, within the space of robotics, you know, what tools do we have within robotics to make these robots effective collaborators? So um, I will argue there's three main uh, um, areas of robotics that you know, we can really focus on as providing a lot of the tools, underlying tools, um, for us to complete this. One is proprioception and control. Do you know where you are, and do you have the ability to control yourself? Right? Do you have the ability to perceive your environment, either visually or through touch, as being perhaps primary methods to do that? Do you have the ability to plan and characterize and model what you see, the other agents in your environment, and yourself, and how they all work together in order to achieve target behavior for the team? So jumping first into this sort of proprioception and control, and just you know, for those who are unfamiliar, a quick overview of what you know, is present. You, know, you have forward kinematics. Let's say I have a robot that has joints. Clearly, we're able to have encoders. We're able to have torque, you know, position, velocity control. We're able to model our internal dynamics, right, um, and which will allow us to actually achieve the motions that we would want to uh, perform. On the side of uh, this sort of planning for your motion, right, if you have many degrees of freedom, you know, motion planners have been around for quite a while. The more degrees of freedom you have, the state of the art um, is either to use uh, methods like uh, uh, sample-based planners to plan in your environment. I mean, even more recently, there actually have been really cool demonstrations of using neural networks 
particularly RL algorithms that have actually learned how to map some input desired motion to what the state should actually do to do things really quickly. There's one really cool video out there um, where uh, a particular arm is actually able to catch a flying object based on an RL algorithm that was actually trained to understand the kinematics of the arm and it could catch an object in real time. And then you have the ability uh, for uh, control, right? So if I'm actually touching my environment, can I actually exert or control the amount of force that I'm using to interact with my environment? Expanding a bit on that ability to contact your environment, you know, there's two main paradigms you might uh, end up thinking about. You have, you know, the ability to control, you know, the amount of stiffness that you apply on the environment, or you can actually control the amount of admittance that you accept from your environment. In a sort of impedance controller, you're setting an objective that you want the arm to follow. However, you actually have the ability to modulate the stiffness of your system to respond to that external input or perturbation. On the admittance side, perhaps again you have an objective you want to follow, but if there's an external disturbance, you allow yourself to take that disturbance in a meaningful way. And this is not only in the case of uh, perhaps you know, hand manipulation, but even this plays a really big wall, uh, role in robots that are even you know, walking in particular environments. So you might find yourself uh, using an admittance controller for a walking robot so that based on where it puts its feet down, right, it doesn't try to jam through, um, which would actually cause imbalance, but reacts to the different terrain that it touches by allowing that admittance um, in contact. And so these two paradigms can be very useful depending on what your task is, and you would you know, make that decision based on your objective. On the side of perception, right, we've seen many, many uh, amazing advances um, in uh, different tools like uh, CNNs that allow us to extract key information from visual data. We, of course, have laser rangefinders, right, that are able to detect, uh, you know, objects at a distance and give us a really high fidelity point cloud or even up close. Here, uh, I think this is with uh, an Intel RealSense, or PicoFlex sensor, excuse me, that's observing this person's face. And then we have the onset of even tactile sensors. Here shown uh, an early version of gel site versus um, a piezo, uh, I think, uh, resistive material um, that allows you to feel contact. So all of these um, uh, are extremely important, and we've seen a lot of really cool um, you know, use cases of these, particularly in the camera sensing and the laser rangefinder integration for, you know, estimating, you know, the system state. But if we want to think about the role that collaborative robots could eventually play in our future, we perhaps want them, for instance, in our homes, in assisted care, living facilities, possibly in the warehouse doing small assembly. And so I would argue that one of the things that still needs a lot of work is actually this space over here, this tactile sensing. That's the catalyst. If we had a robot that could feel you know, closer to the way a human could feel right, and really bridge that gap, I think it would open up a lot of really cool avenues for research to address these different areas. And so while we've been able to already make a lot of uh, progress in these other spaces, I think this is actually one of the key barriers that is still holding us back to wide acceptance of robotics in everyday life. So let's think about where we would like to be. So this is a a great motivating uh, video from OpenAI where um, you know, they're able to actually solve this Rubik's Cube with one hand. What you don't see um, behind the curtain uh, is in fact you know, uh, cameras that are externally looking at the hand and all of the hours of RL that was trained uh, uh, used in order to um, provide this feedback. Additionally, while this uh, sensor does have the attributes of um, having basic contact sensing, um, if I recall correctly, that wasn't extremely leveraged or extremely useful in terms of that planning. And when you want to actually move to a new object, this can actually be very challenging. So if we kind of think about that modular aspect of touch, right? Here's where we want to be, and we want to be able to actually you know, apply this to any new task very quickly, right? What do we need to think about? Well, let's zoom in a little bit and focus on those points of contact and what we can think about there. So if we look at you know, where we are, this is um, you know, uh, this work on this uh, gel slim sensor. So what you see here is you have a camera that's inside of this uh, fingertip. It reflects off of a mirror and observes through a transparent gel the deflection of the boundary. 
And that, uh, the interface of one of these sensors is what you end up seeing there on the top left when it plays. Now these markers have been uh, placed on here at a, a discrete um, step. And when you actually form, uh, when you actually contact an object, it causes deformation. And that deformation can be tracked through optical flow or you know, image comparison. And this actually shows you the stresses that have been applied on the face of that object. And so with this, you can have some notion of displacement of the, uh, of the hand. And then this can actually allow you to think about, right? in fact, you know, what types of forces are actually being applied. And the challenge here becomes, you know, really, how can you calibrate these systems? Right? That's still an open question, calibrating these really well and at high resolution. So if we dig a little bit deeper into the types of tactile sensors that are available and what can be done currently, you know, you have um, you know, this classic uh, biotech sensor here um, that gives you um, smaller resolution than you know, perhaps the vision-based sensor, but extremely reliable um, and gives you a few points of contact. You have sensors such as the Digit, which are 2D-shaped vision-based sensors. So you can see that the fingers themselves are flat. Um, but this is really easy to integrate with some uh, nice hands, and you can actually have that effect if you can get the object between those fingers in that flat region. You have more curved fingers, so here we'll call it like 2.5D. You know, the sensor like bubble soft, so it um, uses like pneumatic pressure to expand inside of this uh, finger. So it's kind of like a balloon, and then they uh, use um, a time of flight sensor that's inside of the hand to track the deformation of, you know, points on that surface as it touches an object. And then you have bringing this all together uh, on the far end. How do you shrink this, compact this? This is the OmniTac uh, Omni sensor developed um, at Berkeley, which uses a, a, a set of micro cameras that actually look through at particular subregions of the finger and are able to then track those subregion deformations by treating them relatively flat, by you know, zooming in on those particular areas um, of, the, of the finger. So you know, in the arm lab, we said you know, these are all fantastic. Um, but you know, where is there space to grow here? You know, is the perfect finger out there? Right? And so we began to think about what you know, that finger might look like. And within that space, we asked ourselves from a design perspective, can we leverage anthropomorphic inspiration in a curved fingertip capable of deforming uh, and sensing friction as well? From a modeling perspective, can we efficiently model a continuous curved fingertip with high resolution that allows us to have this in a computationally tractable way and characterize stable grasps. And this is a note that actually means, you know, if we're able to achieve this, unlike a lot of the approaches which use end-to-end -end learning, if you have this high resolution image of your points of contact and you're trying to map this all the way back to small joints that you should, this is a huge space. And adaptability can be a real challenge when you want to change from one object to another. So if you modularize, modularize your network and you're able to say, you know, I can characterize, even with a machine learning model, right, what a stable grasp is, then can I actually use that as a sub-module, perhaps, in an RL framework to allow me to do more complex manipulation strategies? And then that's what comes next, the motion planning. How do you leverage those models, that design, in order to do um, efficient continuous modeling of your fingertips to plan multi-finger grasps for in-hand manipulations? So toward that objective, um, the Arm Lab has developed um, this new sensor uh, we're calling DenseTact. Um, and it has uh, this particular form. So currently, it's this very hemispherical sensor um, that's relatively uh, cheap to make, less than $100. And the most of that comes from the camera itself. And we have LEDs that illuminate the interior of this uh, sensor. Um, and then we have a coated gel on the end so that when you touch this, you can actually track the deformation um, um, interior. And so this first version of the sensor is really good at sensing shape. Now, one of the key benefits here, let me see if this video will play. One of the key uh, benefits here to think about, right, is how we can actually um, calibrate such a system. How can that calibration um, be achieved? And so um, uh, in a paper that was recently accepted, you know, our, our objective here is to say, well, you know, if you actually look at many different modalities of calibration, including um, perhaps having external sensors like time of flight sensors that look at your sensor um, externally, this can actually be very challenging, right? To actually uh, say, you know, how much on the on the order of millimeters, submillimeters, 
was this uh, deformation of my sensor everywhere. That's extremely challenging. So our approach was to actually say, what if we pressed our sensor into known shapes? That itself, you know, if you 3D print these, you know, have an associated error that comes from the 3D printer. And then you have the gift of, you know, when you look through this um, camera, you can actually see the high resolution image that's generated um, when you actually perform um, that deformation. And because you're pressing into these known shapes, now you know where the position is everywhere at your points of contact. And so now you actually have this really uh, nice supervised data set, images correlated with uh, you know, a shape that you know everywhere. And now you can actually perform learning you know, through um, a sort of autoencoding framework with skip connections to say, you know, how can I actually map my image to an output radial depth map using ray tracing, where I'm actually using my loss function coming from uh, you know, a known shape that I pressed into, allowing me to have this really high resolution uh, 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 calibrated um, touch. And so now we actually have this ability to actually model um, this at a very high level. And because we were able to calibrate this really three-dimensional curved sensor at this high level, now we can ask a lot of interesting questions that you can't really get otherwise and even have an outcome of you know, this point cloud you see on the far uh, right-hand side. Um, and so you know, kind of thinking about these kind of use cases, you know, there's a lot of different spaces uh, to expand this. Now that you actually have this calibrated high resolution uh, uh, point cloud of your, of your surface, what can you do? You know? And so you know, to that end, we're actually doing work in exploration, seeing how we can combine um, vision um, and touch together to, for instance, you know, improve NERFs, uh, neural radiance fields, um, in order to better represent you know, objects that you're exploring. Um, you can think about, you know, in the second generation of these sensors, which I'll show on the next slide, you know, if you can actually then add in addition to the, uh, this is a screw, and then this is the point cloud of the screw being pressed in, you're seeing here in the uh, top corner here. If you then take to the next step and you say, okay, you know, if I can get forces as well, shown here, so this is um, uh, the generation 1.5, we're actually a little bit better than this now, with generation 1.5, you know, put on to, you know, the Allegro hand, you can still begin to track these forces. So, you know, here in this first column uh, on the right-hand side, you know, you have the undeformed um, sensor and you're pressing into this uh, a penny here. And if you go on that normal side, as you push more, you can see this optical flow data showing the expansion um, in this case. For shear, you can see the shear directions. And for torsion, you can see that torsional um, effect coming. And so again, you could say, okay, well, how does this really differ, for instance, from you know, some of the methods of you know, like gel site? Well, the real takeaway that we're trying to really approach here is to say, well, you know, if you just had the points, right, you can actually have an aliasing effect. So if I produce a shear with like the gel site, gel slim version, you know, and there's too much distortion, then after a particular amount, there's aliasing that can be uh, in effect. If you keep track of that you know, over time, then you can kind of avoid that by you know, performing some sort of integration. But that produces more model overhead um, for you to complete that. Even if you were to, for instance, have like, you know, X's, you know, even for like rotation, you know, simple you know, crosses would still um, produce a degree of aliasing, even angular, you know, from some angular deformation. So the question we're thinking about in the, from the pattern side is, can you generate a pattern that in a small enough resolution could actually be robust to extreme deformation, right? And that could be both from shear or torsion. Um, and if that's possible, right, this gives you a completely different paradigm in terms of what you can then come back and say, can I calibrate this at a super, you know, at a higher level of, cal uh, of contact where I can actually um, say more about those points, you know, in between the uh, measurements that I'm able to make. And so there's two parts there. On the design side, there's how can we develop a pattern that allows us to have this higher resolution for our deformation. And then on the second side, it's how do you calibrate the highest resolution sensor in the world, right? You know, this is literally, you know, more points of contact per area than, you know, any high resolution sensor that exists, you know. And so our approach to this, uh, which you'll see more coming up in the few months to come, is to really say, well, can we actually uh, begin to think about um, the fact that, you know, if we were able to use uh, meta learning, right? Can we actually look at, you know, modeling this in simulation to actually use a methods like a Gaussian process to say, 
you know, if I contact this particular area and I'm able to actually measure these particular points, you know, with an actual real sensor that I'm calibrating with, if I can use a Gaussian process that can capture the material properties, right, and also have a notion of uncertainty in the points that I'm not measuring, then can I actually use that, um, that meta-learned model that's trained in simulation to then come to the real world with a real sensor that is at a lower resolution than the sensor I have, and then use a Gaussian process with the real points of contact to say, at the points that I'm measuring, I'm very confident. Feed that back you know, through your error, MSC error on your image to say, you know, did you predict, for instance, the stress, the correct stress at this point? And where you're uncertain, you know, then use that as a weighting factor for your error as you back prop that through your network in predicting uh, what you're, where you're in contact. And so with that, not only do you have the ability to say, you know, I'm training this uh, high resolution sensor with a few points of contact and using a Gaussian process to interpolate in between, but that Gaussian process is also informed by the mechanics of the material that I'm touching and the uncertainty allows me to um, inform my network that if there are points far from the points that are actually in contact, you should ignore that at that particular time. And so you know, in, in the few months to come, you'll see some exciting work in that space that allows us to calibrate this at, at a higher level. Once that's achieved, right, we can then say, you know, okay, uh, I have all of this calibrated force wrench you know, on my sensors, and if I'm touching an object at multiple points of contact, Right? What does this tell me about my grasp stability? Right? And so you know, if you kind of look back into the literature and mechanical engineering like in the 90s, you know, they brought up this notion of like, uh, you, know, you had friction cones, which is to say I push in with a normal force you know, into a plane and there's friction. How much friction can I reject in any direction? If it's an if it's a, 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 a isotropic material, then no matter which direction you're, you're pu uh, pushing in, the friction is the same in that surface. And if I have multiple points of contact, then I can you know, resist motion from the normal force that I'm applying and the friction forces that can stop that motion when I'm holding an object. And so if you have point contacts, this actually creates a polytope in what we, what we call the wrench space. So if you think about you know, just forces for now, no moments, if you have the three axes for the forces and I'm, I'm able to reject forces in any direction, this creates a polytope that says if you apply a force on this object, like gravity, Right, as long as it's inside of this polytope, you can reject those forces and keep the object in place and stable. And you can extend that notion to you know, the moment space as well, and that becomes a six-dimensional space for your wrench, right? X, Y, Z, and then moments about the X, Y, and Z axis. And the more points of contact you have, the more complex that polytope becomes. Well, now we have soft fingers. So now it's not just point contacts, it's these continuous contacts. Instead of thinking polytope, we should now start thinking manifold, right? And so what does that look like? And if we have this, this notion of manifold that comes from perhaps a learned model instead of like a, an FEM sort of approach to this, so it can be calculated more quickly, how could such a model for a, point for a, 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 a series of contacts, an in-hand grasp, be actually leveraged in an RL framework that's informed by that? So if I want to transition an object in my hand, you know, as I think about the multi points of contact as I manipulate it, can my planner have knowledge of that six dimensional manifold of grasp stability and plan in her, uh, you know, multi contacts and motion of the fingers that keeps the object in the manifold of grasp stability between the contacts that I make? More fun stuff coming later this year. <laughs> and so, yeah, that can then inform uh, multi grasps and, and NARL planners that could leverage such a model. Shifting little uh, gears a little bit here to intelligence, right? You know, if we consider a lot of the tools that can be good for um, predicting um, behavior or actions of the other, um, often you know you find yourself in a need to be able to predict the trajectory of what your uh, teammate is actually doing. And within this kind of uh, structure, you could think about um, ontological models, which you know again postulate some underlying uh, structure. Or you can think of uh, data-driven um, approaches. Um, and this is what you've, uh, has been very popular in the literature, is generative approaches to try and model the, uh, the behavior and um, and, uh, of agents that you're collaborating with or trying to predict. And then tying this back to you know, uh, robotic consensus and swarm behavior, you know, we see that you know, common algorithms for cooperation can be categorized as 
A having an oracle, you know, a single entity that's telling all the others what to do. You could have a shared plan where all agents act independently towards some predetermined goal. Um, and then you can even have consensus through some type of voting um, system. OK, so we've kind of discussed some of the tools that we have in terms of you know, uh, proprioception and control, uh, perception, external perception, right, and intelligence. So you know, what must be considered for a, a human, an effective human robot team? So if we think about that, I would argue that some of the key challenges for human robot teams you know, really come down, to, again, to that digital communication conversation. What do robots need to be effective teammates for humans? I would argue you need the ability to uh, model complex tasks, the ability to interpret and manipulate environments configured for humans, and the ability to model teammates' actions and roles. So uh, what we're going to do is look at some uh, examples now um, in two main categories, one being um, wearables that effect effectively augment the human that they're supposed to work with. Um, we'll look at some that are designed to substitute an ability of the human, some that are designed to enhance the ability of a human. And then we'll look at you know, a more formal sort of collaborator, if you will, an external collaborator that serves as sort of a human partner, some examples in the arm lab that kind of look at that. So at this point, I'm going to kind of transition to some of our work um, that we've been working on over the past few years um, and kind of give an outline of you know, what we've been looking at in these, um, in these spaces. So starting with you know, an ability substituting device, right? particularly for wearables, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is what part of the human being is being augmented or substituted? And then is the robot um, augmentation functionally adequate? You know, does the presence of the robot feel natural um, and easy to use? So this uh, uh, motivates well one of our uh, projects called the uh, Intelligent Prosthetic Arm Project. It's motivated if you think about uh, individuals who have shoulder disarticulation. Um, here this individual has uh, uh, disarticulation on both sides. Completing tasks with body power devices um, is possible but very challenging, particularly as the complexity of the task increases um, from a dexterity standpoint. And so the question we ask is, you know, if you have um, a, a, a prosthetic that is endowed with robotic autonomy, could it actually be informed by the complexity of the task that you're trying to complete, as well as whatever possibly limited input you're able to accept from the human? Can it interact with the human? Uh, and then through those modalities, actually give the person a sense of agency so they can complete a task uh, with a level of dexterity that they would have otherwise not been able to accomplish. Now, um, if you're familiar with the space, you might be aware that there are you know, devices that exist out there, like the Luke Arm or MPL. Right? And a lot of these are you know, driven directly, um, complete control through like EMGs, um, electromyography, you know, or BCI, brain-computer interfaces. Uh, in order to achieve that control. But the challenge with all of these is, you know, no matter how deep, how, how deep you go, usually you're still de dealing with an under-actuated problem, which means given the high degrees of freedom you want to control in the arm, the human is unable to provide the number of inputs, independent inputs that match that output. And even as you get closer and you continue to ask more and more from the human, you actually end up sometimes uh, negatively affecting the human with cognitive load. They've got to remember what the new mapping is everywhere, and that can be really challenging. Now, of course, they adapt and learn over a long time, but that can actually be a barrier for the use of the device if you then couple that with things like its weight you know, and uncomfortability and things like that. And so what you see here um, is the first step for us trying to move toward that goal. And what we've actually uh, done here, uh, my student uh, Shivani Gupta Sarma, you can see we're actually simulating uh, an arm inside of a HoloLens 2. And so you actually see this simulated arm here. And I'll get into a little bit later some of the tasks that we want to start off with, which allows us to first just jump over the hardware questions and allow our system to perceive the environment, allow our system to actuate virtually. And then we can really focus on the intelligence. How can we really get information from the human to perform the task, be it through EMGs, EEGs, or with our collaborators, even um, ECOG, you know, to actually get input from the human to do these complex tasks. 
Um, and today I'm going to really cover just the cases when the robot knows the task, but we're even interested in looking into solving problems about cases when the robot doesn't know a task. How do you perform learning from demonstration You know, when there's no demonstrator and you don't have arms to demonstrate? How can that be achieved? And this is, this is you know, the case what we're looking at, and we realize that augmented reality, again, can play a really big role in giving you a sort of a playpen to query the human for demonstrations and even visually demonstrate to the human what you understand the uh, domain of acceptable performances to be. And if that's validated, um, allow the uh, robot to then execute you know, in a very efficient manner. So kind of expanding on this a little bit more, uh, if you think about an able-bodied person here, you know, they're able to uh, you know, plan, control, actuate themselves, their body responds, and they're able to perceive that as they're performing some task on the environment. If you imagine having a powered prosthesis, um, then they're going to be providing some input via EMG or BCI to that uh, system. Right, in order to, for it to actuate and perform some task on the world. And um, unless there was some surgery that actually mapped some of their nerves for feedback, which has been done, then usually um, they have to perceive themselves you know, what has actually occurred in their environment. Then you can imagine having some robotic systems that actually have a, a degree of perception as well. Um, so maybe there's not a, an extreme amount of you know, internal intelligence, but maybe if you touch something hot, you know, it can withdraw from something hot and give you some very basic low-level controllability. And then finally, you know, you have what we're aiming for here, which is the intelligent powered prosthesis. It has the ability to plan, the ability to act, the ability to sense, and at the same time take information and provide information to the human that it's working with so that you have essentially two minds and one goal. So, you know, one of the key enabling technologies here I kind of alluded to is augmented reality. And I think, you know, while it's traditionally been, you know, thought of a lot in terms of the gaming space, I think it has a whole lot to offer in, you know, essential utility. Um, and this is a perfect example um, of that utility. So things you can get with, like, information you can get from uh, systems like a HoloLens 2, you know, include um, the gaze from the person. You can actually track where they're looking in their environment. Um, and, of course, you're able to actually project, in the augmented reality case, objects into their real environment that look hyper-realistic. Um, and that interfacing, um, if done well, um, can actually be a very nice way for the robot to get information from the person in terms of attention, as well as provide cues and questions to the person and feedback based on what the robot wants to do without running the risk of actually acting on the environment at a given time. So as a kind of example here, you have this, um, you know, consider this activity of daily living of feeding yourself. So you can think of this in terms of a state machine. Um, and if, for instance, um, I treat the gaze as this circle and uh, plus sign here, you know, if the question initially was, do you want to actually feed yourself or, you know, take a drink? There's no uh, fluid in the cup, so probably you can't manipulate the cup yet until you've actually, you know, filled it. Uh, then gaze could actually be a really good indicator, for instance, on you know, the fact that you might want to interact with the pitcher first in order to you know, fill your cup. Once you're filling your cup, perhaps you know, to provide agency, if you don't want the robot to just passively do stuff, you want to feel like you're in control, perhaps some other device like an EMG could actually inform the device to continue the process. But maybe the gaze is not as important at that instance when you're knowing what you know exactly what the task is. You can provide that agency you know, by only asking for much lower degrees of freedom input from the person to complete that task, like complete the poor. And then you could have a, uh, potentially a choice. Do you want to actually want to go from the pitcher to feeding yourself or perhaps taking a drink? Again, perhaps gaze can then play another significant role in helping you make that decision. And then perhaps you know, there's too much cognition involved in actually determining where on the plate you want to scoop. Maybe autonomy, again, can play a nice role here and actually helping the person. And then you know, EMG, again, can be a big uh, help in that reduced degree of freedom in providing agency to the person while they complete the task. So if we want to kind of think of this sort of uh, idea mathematically, right? then let's kind of think of this you know, in this uh, type of uh, framework. Right? What, act, what information do we have? So if we, uh, if we think of here uh, you know, our state you know, as S, our gaze vector is G, perhaps some other input like EMG as E and some uh, desired robot action is A. We can even develop a very simplistic model 
for thinking about what action should the robot do conditioned on the state of the task and the available input from the human. And so, you know, steps to solving this would first be, can you actually model the human's behavior? If you knew what the human was trying to do, what action it was, and you knew the state of the system, right, can you actually model what you'd expect them to do? Where do you expect them to look? What you'd expect them to, to, to fire in order to achieve that? And then you can actually, you know, more abstractly say, given a particular state of the system, what makes sense contextually, right? What is the action that you would do conditioned on the state of the environment at a given time? And then, you know, you could actually, you know, nicely frame this even in terms of Bayes' rule to help you arrive at a, a best estimate or a probability distribution about what you think the person would want to complete. And so even solving that, um, you know, such a system here allows you to characterize the human behavior model and intent model to then predict what action you think you should take conditioned on what the human information the human provided to you and the state of the task and environment. Um, some people like to visualize this you know, graphically, so kind of thinking of it in that fashion. Uh, again, imagine this example where you're trying to determine what the human wants to do here. Do they want to manipulate this cup that might be empty initially, or this pitcher which might have some fluid in it initially that you might want to pour to to then drink from this cup? So based on that simple task understanding, if you know the cup is empty, you perceive that it's empty and the pitcher was full, you might have some initial distribution here. Think of this, this manifold as a di probability distribution that is more likely you might want to interact with this picture at this standpoint just because from a uh, task understanding that's what makes perhaps the most sense. But you don't know. Maybe the person did want to actually grab the cup and you know, place it somewhere else. So what other information could you pull from the person? Perhaps you have some gaze you know, of the person that intersects the table and you could think of that itself as actually producing a probability distribution in that environment around the known task that you could be completing. And then, of course, perhaps you have some input, be it from EMG or some BCI, that's driving at a low dimensional um, state that you want to take some action to begin with on your environment. And perhaps if you condition all of these things together, this can actually allow you to have both um, an intent model um, uh, and a behavioral model uh, to help you determine you know, what action makes the most sense at that time to complete. And what's really cool is you can kind of decouple it, if you frame it in this way, you can kind of decouple the notion of you know, what makes sense in terms of a task, right? what actions would you do in terms of a task, which would in fact allow you to collect a lot of data even from people who don't necessarily need the device to understand this relationship for all the different task spaces that you could have. Um, and then separately, you could actually train this sort of calibration routine. If I specify to the user, here's the state, and we want you to complete this action, I can calibrate this to you. This is the calibration phrase, which is even done for conventional prosthesis, right, in order to understand what the mapping is for the person to complete um, a specified task. As a first step to trying to uh, complete this, um, and let's see if this video is playing. Yes, fantastic. You know, uh, we're, we're working on a, a work right now where we say, well, what if we actually do this in terms of a chess game? So imagine, you know, you have this virtual arm, a virtual chess board, and you're trying to complete this uh, game of virtual chess. You could actually ex uh, take, you know, the state of the environment to actually be the state of the game, right, and say, you know, given this particular game, what would be the likely strategy to maximize points? That can give you an indica indicator of P of action conditioned on the state. And then you could take some input from the EMG, you could take some input from the gaze, and then use that to inform you about which piece the person would probably likely try to move, and then validate for our method, you know, does this actually, for instance, reduce cognitive load? And so the end goal here, while we might be um, having some fun with checkers right now, the end goal would ultimately be to then apply this at a higher level to some of these more complex tasks, of, such as activities of daily living. With the objective again being that, you know, if we implement this method, right, would our system actually be do uh, give the uh, ability to this uh, to the person to a, you know, be more intuitive? Would it actually be easier to learn how to perform the task better? The learning rate could that be sharper? And then, you know, if we have this ability to integrate autonomy, then unlike body-powered devices or just simple you know, electric devices that have to be completely controlled by the person, can just the overall functionality of the system be at a higher level, 
right? And so, you know, our goal is to actually increase both of these things. Can we increase the learning rate, right? And then can the person actually perform at a higher level once that maximum learning, uh, if you will, is achieved? So kind of transitioning now from uh, an ability substituting device perhaps to an ability enhancing device, uh, you can think here um, about uh, you know, ones that improve the sensory feedback um, concerning uh, the world. So one of our leading projects here um, is actually a fall prevention sensor that we've um, developed in our lab that will ultimately, we think, also be useful for lower limb exoskeleton path prediction uh, and control. So as a first step here, you know, we realized that you know, uh, one of the leading causes of fatal and non-fatal uh, injuries for older adults can be falling. And so you know, if you had a device that could actually predict in the next few seconds that you at, were at high risk of falling and it was able to alert you, would that actually possibly reduce that risk? And if so, you know, perhaps you know, reduce the number of um, you know, first steps that are leading to these unfortunate cases. Right? Um, and then, of course, the question is, you know, can we actually have a system that you know, people would want to wear? at the same time? Can it have this really cool robotic functionality at the same time perform um, at this level? And so our, our architecture is to say, you know, if we actually have an onboard sensor that is actually able to see the environment and um, uh, actually collect odometry or your path right from an onboard IMU and um, information about the, uh, the environment, uh, can you actually use that um, in, for instance, like an RNN or GRU structure to then say, I'm, I, I see the sequence of where you went from your odometry, and I'm able to see your surroundings. Can I use that information to predict perhaps a multimodal distribution about where you will go? And can I have some notion of how stable you will be in that path that you'll take? And if you actually go to the, you know, the community that actually tries to predict stability, there's actually not consensus on the notion of what stability it is you know, um, as well. Um, and so the question um, really comes out um, you know, uh, so given that instance, how do you actually characterize stability, right? And so, you know, one way we're actually approaching this is to say, can we characterize the variance in someone's sway or the second order variance in someone's sway? So if you're swaying a lot, you know, you know, obviously everyone has a certain amount of sway when they walk. If that variance increases a lot for you, then likely you might fall. And so if we can kind of have a baseline for your sway and then notice that increase in that variance, then that can be an indicator that you might be at risk of falling, and that's what we want to mitigate. And so a quick video I'll show um, to that end really shows um, you know, what this actually can look like you know, in a particular environment. So we have you know, a person walking with the sensor, you know, walking through this environment. Here we have a depth panorama image that's actually fed into our network that allows the system to actually um, have a representation of the environment in addition to the pose that you walked in. And the goal would be to predict the person's path, gait, and stability um, on that trajectory. And we actually have like an active study that we're doing now, um, so looking for participants that would want to participate um, in collecting such a data set. I know I'm coming up on time here. Um, oh, I was just giving you time. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> really think you were spot on. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on the other side here, we have um, external collaborators. Right, so this is a really uh, great project that uh, we are working uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Dorsey Sadiq um, uh, and my uh, uh, graduate student Eli Ng uh, and JD. Uh, and so here we have, you know, uh, the goal of this project is to say, you know, can we actually learn from how humans collaborate together to actually uh, uh, tr introduce a robotic agent that could substitute one of these humans and still perform at a really high level in terms of, you know, the collaborative task. You know, the pandemic hit, uh, and that was very unfortunate. And so we were able to pivot uh, to an, um, an online format of this data collection um, that still allowed us to get the information we needed. So in an online gameplay scenario, if you watch humans carry you know, a table together virtually and try to avoid obstacles and perhaps pass through waypoints to a goal, can you actually leverage their force inputs on that underlying you know, second order dynamics to help you understand how um, the system is expected to evolve. And if you actually observe how humans do that demonstration, if you collect those data sets, can this actually inform you how the robots are, uh, is expected to perform? And then the question becomes, you know, which type of modeling technique is best in terms of behavioral modeling um, as well as uh, world modeling and bringing those together to be the most effective in a first order or second order mental model of your teammate. 
We're also thinking about ways we can actually increase the efficiency of learning from demonstration, again, realizing the huge potential that augmented reality provides us, not only in the task description, which can play a really big role, but even in uh, once you have that information, how can the robot then anticipate the actions of the uh, person that it's collaborating with and sometimes take actions that actually improve the overall performance of the team, um, even if the uh, human may not particularly be expecting that behavior. So in a simple example of like carrying a box, if the human is carrying boxes that are too heavy for them, then the overall team is at a, at a, at a loss because it's taking longer to transport. But if you actually anticipate that the human will carry boxes that are too heavy and the robot steps in and says, I'm going to carry the heavier boxes, and the robot can then, uh, then the human can then carry the lighter boxes, and you've increased the, the performance time of the entire team by uh, modeling that person in real time and anticipating that to make the overall team better. So, uh, so lastly, the takeaways here um, are uh, to be effective collaborators with humans. Robots must be able to model human behavior in their role. Um, there's a significant room for improvement in robotic hardware um, for alternate forms of communication, such as audio, visual, and tactile. And uh, robot collaborators have the potential to expand uh, their human teammates' capabilities, enhancing and restoring their quality of life. Thank you very much. You're kind of in your uh, human collaboration project where you have these different, say, robot manipulator arms that you're manipulating, say, some common object with like a human partner. Um, do you, I guess, what are your methods or maybe um, sensors that you're using? You mentioned previously how if you have an environment that's applying an external port to your, like, your uh, built up Jacobian for your robot arm, you can actually set parameters for like the rigidity of your whole system based on this external forces. So typically, when you're applying torques to these, you give it like an electrical signal for it to know what you want from your control. But do you have ways of actually like um, calculating or receiving what those torques are on in your individual joints from like a third, a second party, like a human collaborator that's like trying to push on your robot? It's a fantastic question. So quickly repeating for the people online, you know, when thinking about like perhaps physical, you know, interaction and collaboration. You know, what are thoughts for you know, sensors that can actually get information about forces that are being applied on the system that may themselves be indicators of intent and collaboration to perform a task? So absolutely. So uh, for this particular project, you know, we're in a simulation-based environment, so we have access to the forces that are being applied by other agents. But um, you know, when this evolves to a more physical scenario, you can imagine, A, you know, yes, absolutely, leveraging you know, arms, for instance, that have joint torque feedback that can give you that kind of information from points of contact. Um, and even you know, with the development of our you know, new tactile sensors, you could even imagine feeling some forces even in fingers that could be, for instance, in contact with your environment. Um, but I think you know, even kind of tapping into the bigger question which you're alluding to, which is you know, you know, more generically, how can you leverage force external disturbances you know, in your system you know, in terms of forces to indicate you know, collaboration, I think that's a fantastic, you know, direction of research, and it changes based on the application that you're thinking, right? Um, but I think, again, kind of looking at what these robots are able to do in terms of their ability to sense joint torques, you know, perhaps fingers, and then even, you know, work that's emerging, for instance, in terms of, like, robotic sensitive skin. So, you know, one work that comes to mind is, like, um, work out of uh, Professor Mark Kokolsky's lab, where they actually have pneumatic sensors that they're able to put in different patches on a robot's body and then based on that contact they're able to actually get really sensitive feedback from these pneumatic sensors um, placed everywhere on the robot's um, uh, external part to actually get that sort of information. So what does robotic skin look like you know, as you begin to think about robot safety and, and collaboration? So beyond the finger you know, forces you feel and beyond the internal uh, joint torques, what does that contact actually mean? I think that's a very interesting question. So one thing I thought was really cool is the way you you guys 3D printed some stuff to calibrate the gel super gel site, but I forgot you called dense patch uh, automatically. And it seems throughout the like a, oh also what no nah, okay that's Thomas I know if if you're before I ask the question if you're in the class and you didn't fill out the thing please fill out the thing I've gotten so many emails saying I forgot to fill out the thing I'm just like fill out the thing please. 
Um, and if you ever attend on Zoom, you don't have to fill out the form. Zoom takes automatic attendance. Sorry. Um, I was curious how you see, I mean, calibration seems to be a huge problem in this space. And I'm curious what you see as, as like maybe ways to do automatic calibration where you don't have to necessarily touch five points or something um, with like a prosthetic or, or some augmented geology type of calibration. Yeah, so uh, the question was, you know, what's, you know, the future of calibration? And if I can kind of narrow that question down to specifically maybe the tactile sensors space because of the role that they play. Um, yeah, I think this is, you know, this is where we're really resting our hat, right? You know, these other vision-based sensors exist. The questions we're asking is from your design, how can you get as much resolution from that contact as possible? And there are other sensors that have like really high density points. You know, there's some that use like, um, I think it's um, dense optical flow where they actually have like every pixel is a different thing where they have to associate some aliasing effect you know, to actually try and catch the displacement locally on those sensors. So, you know, yes, the million dollar question is, you know, A, yes, how do you design the sensor that gives you this information and account for things like aliasing? And then B, the harder part, in my opinion, is um, then how do you, you know, go in to calibrate and model, right, these, these sensors. So for the shape sensing, we think that that's a really clever way, you know, to, to get a lot of high density information. But the force information, that's just hard, right, because, again, you're dealing with this high resolution point of contact. And if you actually like, kind of think of this from a continual mechanics standpoint, on the surface, you have the normal, the shears, and the torsion that you care about. And all of this, of course, propagates to the material inside of your sensor. Right? And so how do you actually you know, get as high resolution for that as you possibly can is an inherently challenging question. So I mentioned our approach to that, which will um, hopefully be wrapping up soon. Um, but beyond that, let's say you calibrate one of these, you know, again, you can imagine you probably have to have a lot of contacts to get that to work. So um, another work that we're hoping to also have out in the next few, few months uh, or sooner um, is actually thinking about a notion of transfer learning. So if you like train some of these, you know, sensors and it took a whole lot of data to get that, if you've actually replicated to a high degree the material, shape, geometry of a new sensor, could you actually effectively train a new calibrated model for that new sensor with far less interactions, you know, based on um, a transfer learning approach? So I think, you know, once we kind of like solidify some of these techniques, you can imagine, you know, perhaps efficiency coming out of, you know, methods like that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, since we have to wrap up the class now, let's again thank.